Robin Wright from The New Yorker. So good to be with you today. Great to be with you. There's, there's so much to talk about, but it is true that there are big questions in the world today about to what extent the United States can be counted on and what the U.S. stands for. Tell me how you are thinking about this moment. I think this is a moment where not just Joe Biden, but America in general is being questioned by the world. Can we lead? Can we create the new institutions, the structures that will address a, a, an array of issues? I mean, there are so many to talk about, whether it's the fact that warfare is no longer only decided by who has the biggest bombers or the most tanks or the most troops. It's who dominates the, the field of information, who has control of the internet, who has the economic power. Then there's also the kind of rusty infrastructure of ideology, the fact that uh, democracy is in trouble. We celebrated 30 years ago the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Empire, the end of minority rule in Africa, and the collapse of uh, military dictatorships in Latin America. And yet you look at the world, and whether it's Venezuela, the first democracy in Latin America that is now a failing state with rival governments backed by rival powers, South Africa, which was like the United States was to the West, the exception in Africa. And today it's a, a country that's beginning to fail as well with huge electricity blackouts despite gold and oil, where they deployed 25,000 troops to deal with the largest protests since the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, Lebanon, which is a failing state, and it was the Middle East's first democracy. So many challenges uh, that we're, we're doing things piecemeal and there's no great strategic vision. Do you think we stand for something different than during 9-11, for example? I think America hasn't really answered that question. We are so divided among ourselves that we're not even certain what we are. I actually wrote a piece about, is America a myth? And we've gone through many crises in cycles of crises in our lives where we wondered about who we were and we fought a civil war. But I think today the, the question is, um, which side prevails in what is a corrosive political environment? At 9-11, we came away because we knew what we opposed, more united. And I think it is those moments when we oppose something that we do stand together and do say, yes, democracy and the American flag and so forth. But the, when, when we, in other moments, we are not quite so sure about what it is we want, how much we want to intervene in the world. And is it to do good or is it just to protect ourselves? And I think both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan indicated we were out to defend ourselves, protect ourselves, but we certainly didn't leave those countries in better shape than they, than they were. Today, to the extent that enemy exists, increasingly it appears to be China. Do you see that as a cohesive um, shift in American strategic vision? Well, the thing that concerns me about China is that Biden, to his credit, is trying to build the institutions to deal with China, whether it is elevating the so-called quad of Japan and India and Australia and the United States uh, to leader level. Um, Biden hosted after the United Nations a meeting of the four in uh, Washington, and all four of them were present, not, not virtually. They don't like to talk about it in terms of China. They talk about the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, they never mention China when they're talking about the Quad. But we all know kind of it's there. Right? Yes. And the same thing with the submarine deal that brought together Britain and Australia um, to provide nuclear technology so that Australia would have nuclear subs and a greater reach in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, again, not mentioning China, but we all know what it's about. So there is that beginning of a piecemeal construction of institutions to deal with China, but there's not enough that is substantive and there's not, there's not a direction saying to the world, this is what we want to do, kind of for fear that we're going to alienate the Chinese and that will lead them to do something to counter. But the China- And that a lot of American allies aren't, aren't up for it. That's right. The Europeans are kind of divided on between the United States and China and who they, do they want to get involved in with the United States as they were against Russia during the Soviet era. If Trump had never existed, how would you rate Biden so far as a president? How would you think he was doing if Trump just didn't exist? Biden is clearly the most experienced president in American history when it comes to foreign policy. He knows the world. The danger is that he has spent most of his life 
um, beginning in the early 1970s in politics uh, in the 20th century. And the ideas, the format, the framework, the infrastructure uh, of dealing with the world comes from the 20th century. And as I said, he's piecemeal trying to create something as an alternative, but I don't think he's spoken enough, partly because we're stuck between climate and COVID uh, in dealing with existential questions. The problem with American foreign policy, and again, as you know better than anyone, is that we are so often reactive and not as proactive as we could be given our power, whether it's military or economic. We are still very insecure. We've never quite understood that we really are a superpower. And the danger is we've gotten to the point that we may no longer be a superpower because of the, the very many different power centers evolving around the world. So, you know, you made very clear, uh, Biden is by far the most experienced foreign policy hand of any president in recent memory. He's done it from the Senate, he's done it from the vice presidency, he's traveled around the world. He knows many of these leaders individually. His cabinet, are, they're adults, they're also very experienced, they've been around the block, you know them, I know them. And yet the things that he seems to be doing wrong seem to be about basic execution of stuff that these people should know how to do. Why do you think that is? You're right that many of these people are on their second and even third time around, or they've been close to Biden for a very long time. Uh, Biden, at the end of the day, makes the decisions. Um, we know that he has sometimes a bit of a temper. He's going to do what he wants to do, as he did in Afghanistan, over the advice of some of his, his top generals. He thinks he's got a way out and a way into the 21st century. And the problem is I think he sees ways out of the past. I'm not sure that he gets ways into the future. And I, th and I fault some of the people close to him. I'm not sure they're as brave or bold. Um, or uh, as big think. They're, they're good thinkers. They're, they're people with integrity. Um, they're not, you know, newcomers to foreign policy. But I'm not sure I can identify any one of them that I think is, you know, the lightning, uh, the inspiration, uh, the one who's going to be the defining what a different world looks like coming out of conflict. But the thing that was so striking about the United Nations session was how Biden got up and tried to say he was effectively resetting foreign policy, that the era of relentless wars is over and the beginning of relentless diplomacy. Okay, what does that mean? And I'm not sure any of us came away with a better understanding. My gut is that it's a weak administration, that it's, um, its heart's in the right place. Is its mind kind of coming up with enough and its feet moving fast enough? And the answer is no. Let me turn to the Middle East, a place that you've spent an awful lot of time, um, and uh, the United States in focusing more on China seems to be focusing less on the Middle East, and certainly American allies in the region do feel that way. Do you think that the United States should be doing meaningfully less in and with the Middle East? And are we, if, if so, are we handling that well? So every president has said for the almost 70 years, we're going to get out of the Middle East and kind of, whether it's deal with the Soviet Union, deal with, you know, the other flashpoints. And every president has managed to get sucked back into the region, the most consistently volatile part of the world. Um, the tragedy is the United States is leaving at a time that the Middle East has never been in worse shape. There are more failing or failed or fragile states in the region than at any time since World War II. Um, when you look at um, whether it's Lebanon, Syria, Ir Iraq's in terrible trouble, Libya, Yemen, other countries, you know, Egypt, uh, led by a dictator, the Arab Spring has disappeared in, Tunisia, ac across the region. Tunisia's in trouble. Problem. And of course, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, is the crown prince in Saudi Arabia and is engaged in kind of murders whenever he doesn't like somebody. So. Sounds like a good time for the Americans to get out. Well, it, it, sure, but there's one big issue looming out there, and that's Iran. And we can't walk away from the Middle East until we resolve the issue uh, that is represented by nuclear weapons, but really involves now so much more. Now, you recently met with the Iranian foreign minister. 
that's why you came to New York. This is your first time sitting down with him. Uh, so why don't you give me first impressions? Look, this is a regime that is going to be much harder line. It's much more nationalistic. It's looking at the neighborhood. It doesn't want to reach out to the West as much. It claims that it's managed to stabilize its economy. It claims that its resistance economy, as it calls That's it, what they call it yeah. will, will survive. Maybe not thrive, but it will survive, uh, even without a nuclear deal. I think at the end of the day, they want a nuclear deal. But again, I don't think that's, I think we are missing in many ways the threat from Iran. I think there's something very different that's happened, particularly during the Trump era, that the Iranians felt so um, pressured and so cornered that they worked on their missile program, they worked on their drones. And Iran today has the largest missile arsenal in the Middle East. Its missiles can reach deep into China and Russia, as far west as Greece and as far south as Somalia and Ethiopia. And, and, and they uh, launched an attack uh, against Saudi Arabia, their largest refinery, which was quite staggering at the time. Um, that, of course, they've been not in compliance with the United Nations uh, Security Council resolutions on ballistic missiles for quite some time. It's part of the reason why even with the Iranian deal, we still have sanctions on Iran. Um, did you get the sense that they would be willing to negotiate on any of those issues, leaving aside the nuclear deal itself? Well, there, it's, it's the missile issue, it's the intervention in the region, it, their involvement, meddling, whatever. Support of terrorism, yeah, all this, yeah. I don't think that there is any mechanism to compromise. Iran's position on missiles is, okay, you want us to limit ours, then you limit everybody's in the regions, including Israel. And that's a non-starter for Israel. Yeah. So we're not going to go any place on any of these issues. And the danger is that we've gotten to a place with Iran that it will still be a threat. And with the resistance alliance it has built with its allies in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Yemen, they now have missile arsenals from Iran that can hit Israel. Iran never has to lift a finger. It's trained engineers and you know scientists in each of these countries. Iran has the most effective alliance in the Middle East. <laughs> we don't. They do. And that's something they've built up um, steadily over, over the last two decades, but particularly during the Trump era. And the fact that when General Soleimani was killed by the Trump administration, it was quite a slap to the Iranians. Mm -hmm. And their response was virtually nothing. Their bluff essentially had been called by the Americans. And, I mean, that didn't seem like they felt like they were in a strong position, at least at that point. So I think the American military would disagree with you there. Uh -huh. um, well, the attack on al-Assad base, and I was there again in March uh, four times. and Where Americans were stationed. Where Americans were stationed, yeah. and which was the target of the Iranian counterattack. Right. Uh, and, you know, the, the more than 100 troops came down with brain um, injuries. and. The Iranians said that's a warning, and I think neither side wanted to see it escalate beyond that. I think the Iranians were shocked that, that, Suleiman, that the Americans would go after Soleimani. In some ways, he was safe because he was so high level, nobody mm -hmm. would touch him. Yeah. And that we would do this in Iraq, no less, which was an right. ally. Oh, yeah. And he was on an official state visit. You know, this was uh, not one of his kind of nefarious trips. Uh, so, but the Iranians, uh, I think the Americans felt that this was, was a terrifying turn of events and that it signaled how far Iran was willing to go in using its arsenal. It's one thing to build stuff because you're paranoid or you want to defend yourself. It's another thing to actually fire them against a great power knowing that it could lead to repercussions and a bigger conflict. And I don't think Iran wants that yet. So leaving aside the fact that Iran would like to get back into the old nuclear deal because it would reduce sanctions and improve their economy and they had already been complying with the old conditions, what, what else do you think Iran actually is looking for strategically in the region right now? Iran views itself, ironically, as strategically lonely, which is why it has built this network, this alliance. Uh, throughout the region. What it wants in the region is a sense of, I think, security and that it doesn't have to face the kind of war it did in the 1980s when Saddam Hussein invaded one of the Middle East's longest and, and costliest wars, the use of chemical weapons every year when the world didn't care, that Iran developed a paranoia. 
It's, a, it's still a revolutionary environment, remember, and revolutions are always paranoid. We're not to that period of normalcy. I think the Iranians have tried, but there's always been this conflict, most of all, with the United States, and they've never gotten to that point. The revolutionaries are also dying out. They're in their 70s and 80s, and many of them are long gone. They're trying to cater to a younger generation. And so ensuring the, the continuation of the Islamic Republic is part of the goal. And that they have to feel they're not under pressure, whether it's from, or threat, whether it's from Israel or Saudi Arabia and its Sunni allies in the Gulf. In terms of American foreign policy priorities, where would you put Iran today? Is Iran, in your view, a first order national security concern for the Americans? It's a short order priority. It's one they want to get through, get back to the JCPOA, get back to uh, where they were so that Iran is not two or three months away from developing enough fuel to fuel a bomb, uh, and, and then move on. I think this is the, the one that is kind of the last issue in the Middle East, and then let the Middle East stew for itself and sort itself out. I think there will be profound concern about Iran's uh, military capabilities, its mischief in the region. Uh, but in terms of trying to sort that out, that's one that's a tangible achievement. Check that off the list. You've got the nuclear deal, and then you can move on to the climate in China uh, and the things that where Biden really cares about personally. So they got out of Afghanistan, as ugly as it may have been, they need to get the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear deal, done and then on to the rest of their agenda for the rest of the administration. I think that's where they're going. Robin Wright, thank you so much. Thank you.